Welcome to our Signal Media Executive Interview Series. I'm Kimberly Underwood, Director of Digital News Media at AFSIA International Signal Magazine. Welcome to this episode on the importance of multi-path communications at the tactical edge for joint all-domain command and control, which is sponsored by Sigma Defense and Cradlepoint. Today, I'm speaking with Jamie Beer, Sigma Defense's Vice President of Technology and Innovation, and Mark Duvall, Vice President of Federal, Federal Sales from Cradlepoint. The vision of JADS-T2 is to have systems across the entire battle space from all services and partners, networked and connected to provide the right data to commanders for better and faster decision-making. Sigma Defense and Cradlepoint are delivering on the promise of sense, make sense, and act for decision dominance. They are achieving this through multi-path intercommunications, relay and information sharing from the tactical edge to command and control. I'd first like to introduce Jamie Beard. He is a 26 year veteran of the US Department of Defense's Special Operations Community. He has extensive experience in leading and managing diverse teams to solve complex and dynamic problems. As the Vice President of Technology and Innovation at Sigma Defense, Jamie is responsible for researching, developing and integrating innovative and unique solutions to address customer requirements for communications and data within C5 ISR, JADC2, SATCOM, and DevSecOps sectors. Jamie draws on his multifaceted joint experience as a signal operations officer, where he not only was the organizational CIO for command control, communications, computers, cyber, and intelligence, C5I, but he also led the development and integration of numerous advanced communication solutions, providing strategic capabilities to key stakeholders and end users alike. Next, we have Mark Duvall. He is the Vice President of Sales for Federal at Cradlepoint, and he has over 31 years of experience working with the DOD, federal civilian departments, state and local agencies, wireless and cable operators, educational institutions, and utility companies. Mark began his career in 1991 when he joined the US Navy and he spent almost 10 years as an information systems technician. On leaving the Navy, Mark began his civilian career with Marconi Communications, working as a pre-sales and post-sales systems engineer. He later went on to work for other companies such as WorldCom and Marconi Federal in an engineering capacity and has also worked for Ericsson, Verizon Wireless, Osseus Networks, and Nokia as an account director. Mark brings a wealth of knowledge of the wireless industry and the cellular technologies deployed today. Jamie and Mark, so nice to meet you. Great to meet you, Kimberly. Mark. Thank you for having us. Yeah, and I just, I doing um, executive videos is one of my favorite things kind of here at Signal because it gets a really in-depth kind of look at you know what companies are doing and um, you guys are up to some impressive things um, but I also like to you know hear about people kind of I know you guys work really hard you're very focused but what what do you do kind of on your downtime um, to kind of relax and you know clear your mind yeah um, since retiring uh, almost two years ago at the end of this month uh, I really got to uh, fishing uh, especially saltwater fishing so here next week, I'll be taking some well-deserved uh, PTO, and hopefully the conditions will allow me to go all the way out to the Gulf Stream and, and catch some big mahi or some other really exciting catch. Oh, uh, yeah, very cool, and good luck. How about you, Mark? Well, in my younger days, I used to do a lot of triathlons, so I've actually done five Ironman triathlons uh, in my uh experience but uh, now I try to take it a little bit easier and I like to play a lot of golf so that's you know I'm trying to ease into the uh, retirement stages here in about five or six years so that's that's what I'm doing all right nice and you I guess you could go out with Jamie if you're an open water experienced swimmer and swim along the boat while he's fishing yes and then go back in for some golf there you go come yeah. on aboard Mark <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you guys, and um, we definitely have a lot to talk about. I, I know as a reporter, mostly for the Air Force, I do cover a lot of, you know, JADC2 and what they're doing, and it's such an important and kind of big, you know, challenge for the military to make happen. Um, 
So for you all, how do you define multipath communications at the network edge? And what does that mean to you, I guess? So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start first. I go, you know, I think from my standpoint, when I think of multipath communications at the network edge or tactical edge, you know, there are a few things that, you know, come to mind. You know, the first is what technologies or solutions are even available at a particular location? Because that could differ from location to location, because we know that there's different comps in, in different areas of the world, and each branch uses different communications slightly differently. Uh, so the users at the network edge need to know what types of comms they will have available, such as you know military SATCOM or even commercial SATCOM like uh, Starshield, uh, or are there commercial cellular networks in the area, or can private cellular network get established that can take advantage of the SATCOM link for backhaul? Or do they have a mesh network? Do they need to use uh, UHF or HF links to cover those longer distance? All of these things need to be taken into consideration. Uh, so the communication teams can develop their PACE plan for that particular mission. And for those that don't know what PACE is, it stands for Primary, Alternate, Contingency, and Emergency, which I'm sure Jamie knows all too well in, in his, uh, his experience as a signal officer in SOCOM. But uh, this plan helps to designate what are the best forms of, of communications that might be available, as well as the order in which they would be used. So the other thing that comes to mind is not just what technologies are available, but can we utilize these different networks to transmit data over these different links simultaneously so there's no single point of failure and improve the chances of data reaching the intended recipient. Not to mention that all of this needs to be done in a secure manner so that the data is protected. Yeah, Kim really, uh, you know, Mark really hit the nail on the head when he talked about uh, we can we can have all sorts of multipath, you know, dynamic multipath dispersive communications, but that that first factor that he points out is where you're at. The location is a contested environment. You know, is it a restricted environment? Um, is it you know electronic warfare? You know, being deployed in that environment. So absolutely number one. So uh, we we have to know what you know technologies uh, that we can use, transport solutions that are going to be in that area. Uh, I would add that you know for us defining um, you know Sigma Defense. Multipath communications, the tactical edge, um, you know, will we'll inv include all those line of sight topologies. Uh, it's cellular, it's many mesh, like Mark talked about. It's uh, any wireless solution out there, even current GOTS 30 to 512 megahertz push to talk radios, right? We have to have those. Um, and then, you know, new novel technologies such as free space optics. Having a, a slew of those to be able to use simultaneously is, is going to make that difference. But these multipath communications, they're going to have to be woven into that pace plan that Mark talks about, right? That's the important piece. So we're going to have to put it, put them all into this environment uh, for the, from a JADC2 perspective, and they need to seamlessly integrate into whatever data or operational hardware, weapon systems, and everything else that we're using. And it could be data from, from a sensor, uh, a ROIP device now, because radios just aren't pushed to talk over frequency. They're IP-based, so that's data traveling. But any other you know, critical data piece, we're going to have lots of uh, those, those, those communications topologies. Um, lastly, I would say that defining multipath communications at the tactical edge is to have some sort of central processing or compute node that's going to be able to ingest the data, um, it, 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 you know, pull it in, it do some sort of edge compute and processing on it so that it can be disseminated to the right person. Because if we're talking about JATC2, it's that dissemination, the, the, the dominance of the information, as you pointed out in your opening statement, Kimberly, that's getting it to the right people. So whether it's Starshield, in this case, PLEO, but it's also MIO, LEO, and GEO for that long distance backhaul. Right, sure. Yeah, it's all about that decision dominance, and that's going to be so key in you know going up against near peer adversaries in the future and getting that decision making you know better and faster. Can you talk specifically about how you're delivering in inner communications across services, across partners and allies, and how is that an enabler of decision dominance? So, from a cradle point perspective, you know, our solutions have always been purpose built to work out at the network edge. But historically, we've relied on commercial cellular as the WAN transport, but we can really utilize any IP-based link as that WAN connection. And this can be even be configured for condition-based WAN selection where the router uh, chooses the most optimal path for transport automatically. Our solutions also will utilize technologies such as software-defined networking, which allows for intelligent routing decisions to be made by the device based on certain parameters that have been defined by the network administrator. 
it's it's really this built-in intelligence that allows the network to ingest different types of data from different sources, such as ISR, intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance, position location information, and sensor, da sensor data, and be routed within the local domain or extend across domains. And with these types of capabilities, the end user is no longer restricted to only one or two types of network transport, giving them more options to deliver that information where they need it and when they need it in order to make those life or death decisions in a, in a moment's notice. That's really how we do it. We allow our partners like Sigma Defense to really help you know, take what we do and integrate it into a much larger solution so that we are meeting the needs of the uh, end users in these various environments. Yeah, spot on, Mark. I mean, and Cradle Point has, has been there with us from the beginning because they're, they're definitely one of those critical um, connection and, and communications linkages, you know, at the tactical edge that can be used in a lot of different uh, locations. But, you know, it's not only using that cellular piece uh, like Cradle Point, uh, but all those other available now software definable, all those WAN solutions, you know, Mark called it the software defined networking, but using them in such a way that, you know, can we use them so that they cognitively apply that different routing protocol, uh, depending on the environment we talked about in the, the first question. So the environment, so we can apply that cognitive routing protocols because we're going to be in these different environments. So I, that's going to be a critical piece in there that we're, you know, we're working on now. Uh, and then within our, our innovation team within Sigma Defense, we're looking at, you know, variety partners such as Mark and his team uh, to integrate those purpose-built, resilient, robust communication solutions into this, you know, um, uh, modular vendor agnostic platform because it's going to require all of industry to do this uh, to connect that myriad of edge sensors, other data producing devices, and and now you see even you know warfighters are wearing smart devices that transmit and receive data, right? So if you really truly want a sense element of the JAT C two, that's that that piece right there is working. And then these edge compute nodes that I mentioned in the in the, in the first question, um, you know they can if they can be deployed across that operational uh, environment to include that lowest level warfighting element, maybe it's a platoon or a team, um, they apply that locally hosted AI tools, again, multiple partners will be involved um, for that real time analytics, uh, you know, of the ingested um, uh, data and its process there, that specific point in the kill chain will be one of the most critical elements of that makes sense, because now you're going to be able to real time right there on target um, action. Okay, sure. And I know the vision of JADC2, you know, it's not an easy vision. Um, and so how would you guys say, how do multipath intercommunications address some of the challenges that DOD is facing in implementing JADC2? You know, so for me, you know, simply put, you know, multipath communications really gives the end users more options than they've ever had. And more options means not having single points of failure. If you're in a contested environment, having multiple paths, you know, reduces the chance that, that the end user would be completely isolated without any communications whatsoever. At least they would still be able to communicate amongst the team, even if they didn't have some kind of backhaul connection that, you know, reaches further uh, like they would like it to. But, you know, that's to me in a nutshell, it's just it gives them more options. It reduces that single point of failure. Yeah, that's again, you know, Mark and the critical protein are all over it uh, from that theme, because, you know, the question is, what what's the addressing some of the challenges of JATC2 or the duties facing, I would say that is the most critical challenge, the critical link in the entire JATC2 strategy is that communications link. Um, you know, so the DOD, we can we can develop and have the most novel sensors ever seen, the fastest vehicles, most advanced weapon systems ever seen. But if the systems can't transmit, receive, and share that data across the joint and partner forces to rapidly coordinate and execute those operations, then we'll always be in a state of you know reaction by that of uh, strategic overmatch against our adversaries. And with that being said, we all know that our adversaries are looking really hard at our communication pathways, especially the critical links and circuits, i.e. the single point of failure of, of comms. Um, you know, and, and there was even a book written several years ago by a couple of PLA colonels called Unrestricted Warfare. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend, you know, suggest you read that book. But it talks about instead of using, uh, you know, weapons, hey, just render their weapons useless by going after other things. And it does mention communications. Um, so bottom line is the dynamic and, you know, 
dispersive multipath integrated communications by single stovepipe, that's going to be the critical piece to not only the JADC2 environment, you know, but the U.S.'s position, you know, as it gets more and more competitive landscapes. Right, sure. And can you guys provide some specific use cases of how this is being applied today? And then also, can you paint a picture kind of for the future? You know, what's your vision for future deployment on the battlefield? Thanks. You know, one uh, specific use case for Cradle Point is that we're currently part of a fielded solution within one of the program executive offices within the Army. And within this particular program, we, we are part of a solution that provides situational awareness to the dismounted leader and connects them to their network brigade combat teams. So we are essentially the link, the transport, the WAN connection to the LAN connection for the dismounted leader. And I think in the future, you will see this type of capability deployed within you know, military vehicles on the ground, as well as possibly in the air. And I personally believe that we can provide network transport connectivity in almost every part of the world. So the potential use cases are really limited only by the people, place, or things we're looking to connect. And I think in the future, it's about how do we take what we're doing within this Army program, but now expanding it across Marine, Air Force, Navy, and be able to share that same picture across the different, uh, you know, branches simultaneously that's to me the key of, of jadc2 is giving the you know the operational picture to everybody that needs it and it's the same picture you know regardless of the branch or maybe the communications methods you're using yeah and within signal defense you know one of the one of the historical use cases going back to the remoteness assist advice kits out of socom um, and the application of uh, ATAC, the Android Tactical Assault Kit, people now, you know, officially call it TAC. Um, but in, in the TAC world, um, downrange, you can have multi multiple paths, COTS, GOTS, it didn't matter. As long as you had lots of different communications, you know, linkages to share that TAC data between TAC users. And you could have your own TAC environment, virtualized TAC environment, and then you had a federated joint port partner uh, TAC environment. So there is a lot of legacy to that. Uh, and then within Sigma, you know, we're working on a major program and, and Cradle Point's one of our, our big partners on that, where we're taking uh, different multi-end sensor uh, devices and ingesting them over a myriad of different transport topologies to an edge compute device. We're doing some, you know, um, light AI there at the edge processing and then, you know, adding some analytics in there. And then, hey, who needs to get that data? push that data one back to the operators on the target, but two is push that higher echelons. And whether that's through Azure, whether it's through AWS or whatever that cloud environment may be, but the goal is, you know, getting it into that IL-6 presence. So now you have literally situation awareness and, you know, the sense makes sense and act and the act is at all echelons of, uh, echelons of um, command and control. But as for the future, our vision, you know, within the Sigma Defense is one where the newest technologies from across the industry are brought together. They're seamlessly integrated. A future where multi and sensor data is really fused at the tactical edge, advanced algorithms and analytics, uh, machine learning tools, they process and analyzing uh, that data. Um, that data is being extracted into, you know, actual, now actionable information. And that's gonna include critical metadata, um, you know, that's gonna be sent to, you know, remote smart systems that won't require the human in a loop to transcribe you know, data, grid coordinates, everything else. So in other words, having this secure pre-positioned data um, to, that's going to push out to these semi-autonomous systems uh, is going to enable us to do that rapid decision-making. And kind of beyond interconnected communications from the edge to command, what other technological advancements are you all leveraging to help further JADC2? So with Cradle Point, one thing we recently started to do is embed our new platforms, the ability to run virtual containers within contain with virtual machines within containers on our routers, because we're we're seeing a desire to be able to push compute and storage out at you know the network edge, and we think that this is one area that will help enable the use of maybe some different lightweight applications. Uh, Jamie mentioned uh, ATAC. So you could maybe put a lightweight version of ATAC on a container on one of our routers and provide that connectivity to the uh, end users there. And in the event that a WAN connection is lost, at least the users on the LAN side still have access to those applications and can be able to communicate uh, amongst one another. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at is because security is, you know, the 
everywhere, right? We, we can't have a conversation about communications without having a conversation about security. So we're also have done a lot in terms of deploying new security architectures using ZTNA and things of that nature, because it's not just about the communications links, right? It is about how do we protect the data going across those links. So those are a couple of the things that we are doing uh, in our newer you know, platforms to really help expand the, uh, the capabilities of what we uh, have historically done. Yeah, and, that, and that's the beauty of all this, Kimberly, is, you know, as some of the stuff that Mark just mentioned, and, and, and being that Credit Point is one of the partners we're working a lot of this on, is that security piece. So, you know, collectively with Credit Point and a lot of these other partners, we're looking at a lot of those, those attributes, because that's going to be the critical linkages. So, again, it, it, it's awesome to have a um, partner like the Credit Point team. But so it, in Sigma Defense, we're, we're also kind of... Um, we're looking at the JATC2 challenges from a, a holistic perspective, because as a lot of people want to go directly to the sense, make sense and act, uh, we're kind of trying to, you know, big to zoom out a little bit and, and, and identify what limitations and constraints are going to be in the JATC2 and uh, within Sigma Defense. So we're working with all those industry partners um, that do the AI and ML, like I spoke about, um, to have those tools that, you know, can execute at the tactical edge in a lightweight, virtualized or containerized environment. Um, but more importantly, can those AI tools work without being connected to the cloud or back to a larger enterprise? Because a lot of systems that are out there today do some really exquisite AI uh, and analyz analyzation of data, but they have to be connected to the cloud. So when, you know, we talked about that, I think during one of the earlier points is, when that single point of failure and comms goes down, you know, the global comms goes down, how are you going to make sense at the edge if you can't do that AI on that virtualized device at the edge? So that's a lot of stuff we're working on right now and leveraging. And, and obviously, Mark and his team allows us, through some of their solutions, to do localized communications, because that may not be jammed. It might be the bigger strategic links, you know, that have been knocked out. So we can use you know, these multi-path communications at the edge, and we can still communicate um, kind of like below the noise floor or in the background. Um, but we're also, within Sigma Defense, we're leveraging our core DevSecOps competency and experience um, uh, to streamline the way software is rapidly uh, developed and deployed, which is going to play a critical role in the success of JATC2, because you need that secure environment. It's going to unify software development, deployment, security, um, operations so that it builds a framework. So as we take hardware, software, the software definable wins, it, you know, it's almost like I hate to use Apple, but Apple's been doing an awesome job. So if you have a bunch of different things that are built into this ecosystem, it just works, right? I mean, that's their, their mantra. It just works. So we're kind of using our DevSecOps company experience, working with all these partners, putting it into this framework. Um, and then that way we can also built in that framework, you're going to get a continuous deployment, sustainment, updates, and then it does. It helps the resiliency from a cyber threat perspective. All right, sure. And those were all my questions for you guys. Was there anything else you wanted to add? I think the one thing I would add, and I think Jamie would probably agree, is we're not going to solve this overnight. Uh, this is a long-term effort. And I kind of look at it as software development. It used to be you had the one approach where you you, you created your, your software, you got it to a point where it was perfect, and then you were done with it. Now they've really got more of this waterfall approach where everything is always a beta, right? All, it's always being developed. It's, it's never perfect. And I think with JADC2 and everything that we're looking to do, I, I kind of look at it in that framework is it's never going to be 100% complete. There's always going to be something new that's being added or removed to make the, the network what the, you know, the, the military needed to be at that given time, because we know the way that we fought wars 40 years ago was different than 20 years ago to the way it's fought now to the way it's going to be done in the, in the future, because it's, it's not going to be the traditional battlefield anymore that we're, we're used to that Jamie alluded to earlier. I think that's some of the keys is to take away is this is a long term effort that's going to always be continuing to develop, but we have a lot of the technologies already in place that help to enable these things that we've been discussing today. Yeah, two, two points that I, I would I would close with is, is first of all, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, I think in this next contest, contested space, um, we are absolutely going to have to do as much of that sense and making sense at the edge 
um, instead of all the information coming back to one centralized or you know a few different centralized global points and then it's make, making sense there. Obviously, we our code comp commanders are the ultimate act in that decision maker that's going to flow back down. But in that contested environment, we have to be prepared to sense and make sense at below echelon, all the way down to a platoon level, if you will, or whatever, you know, the smallest vessel uh, or the smallest Marine Raider uh, unit will have to sense and make sense. And then that leader, team leader, is going to have to, you know, act and, and use their capabilities there. So I think it's going to be critical that as we go forward, we look at it from the perspective of, you know, JETSI 2, but that sense makes sense act is going to have to be done at the edge. And I think that's why that that dispersive, you know, uh, multi-path communication is going to be super important. And, and the last point that I think is going to be uh, very critical to the U.S., the DOD, uh, but it's going to be for the defense industry. We have got to work together um, because it's not going to be a, a, a single you know, stovepipe solution. One company is going to say, hey, I can meet all these requirements. I I, I haven't seen that. I, I Special operations 26 years as a special operations communications officer for 16 of them. And I've never seen a company be able to do all those critical links in the chain. So let's band together, uh, work with our DOD partners, and then, you know, figure this out. And, and it's going to take a myriad of understanding, hey, Sigma Defense to say, hey, you know what? We don't do that really well, but hey, Cradle Point, you guys do this, you're, you're exquisite in this. Hey, let's team up. Let, let's get this done. Um, so those are the two biggest things that's going to be the su success of JATSI too. Right, sure. Well, thanks, Mark and Jamie, for walking us through that. For more information about the companies, you can go to their, web their websites cradlepoint.com slash solutions for dash public dash sector federal and sigmadefense.com slash capabilities slash jadc2 um, and we'll post those also on a uh, slide so if you didn't get my uh, quick um talk of you know spelling out the web addresses uh it will be on the slide um we're also recording this in august just before kind of the conference conference season kind of gears up for you know the rest of the summer and fall and into next year where can people find you guys what shows will you be at in the future and where can people look for you so cradle point will be at fca technet augusta and i know we also have the defitic uh, uh, show that's in montgomery for the air force and then and i think later towards november we'll be at uh, technet indo paycom yeah, we'll also be at uh, TechNet Augusta. We'll have some people um, uh, representing us there. Um, and we will be here at Fort Liberty uh, for the upcoming uh, 112th uh, Shadow Warrior um, industry event. And then we'll also be at AUSA. And then again is the uh, TechNet Indo Paycom. Yeah, nice. Well, just from hearing you guys talk and knowing your kind of expertise, I can see what a great team you make. Um, and I love that, you know, you're working on multi-path communications that, you know, just work um, for, you know, warfighters anywhere in the world. Um, thank you, Jamie and Mark, for speaking to us. And uh, this concludes our executive video. Thanks and have a good day. Awesome. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank, thank you. you, guys.